Well, good morning. This is my first day here. I know you guys have already done some like uh, really intense um, piling in the knowledge. I have three lectures today. My name's Ken Milne. I'm the token, is, it's like an affirmative action program. I'm the Canadian here. Um, I'm going to try to withhold all the accents and try to stick with just American. Uh, my first lecture is on pediatrics and whether or not you see peds, and, and we don't know, we don't know specifically what's on the exam, but I can tell you with pretty good confidence pediatrics will be on the exam. So even if you haven't seen pediatrics in a long time, it will be on the exam. And so for the next 75 minutes, we're going to go through some of the pediatric stuff that isn't covered in the other lectures, because some of the other lectures does have specific pediatrics. And we've cobbled together this 75-minute lecture to try to power through some pediatric issues that we think that you need to know. And so if you see children on a regular basis, you may look very zen, like the middle picture. But if you don't see kids regularly, you may be <gasps> like that kid, okay? You might be freaking out every time a little thing comes in spewing sort of oral or fecal material at you and you're going, I don't know. So, we're gonna start with who can you treat? So this is about consenting for uh, minors. And just like everybody else, you can treat them if it's a life or limb threatening injury. So you don't need consent. And in kids, that applies as well. You don't need consent if it's life or limb. You just go and do your job. But then specific states have things that you're required to report. So child abuse, pregnancy, sexually transmitted infections in some states, even mental health in some states have to be reported when treating a minor. Now there is this concept of an emancipated minor. Um, an emancipated minor is if they're married, and there are some states that you can still get married under the age of 16. I'm just letting that out there. Because I, I have a 18-year-old, I, I can't imagine her married. I have a 14-year-old, I can't imagine her married. Holy smoke, 16 and married or 15 and married? Um, and then this, this other one, if you ever see one of these, please write it up in a case report. This is a self-supporting child living on their own. Now I know many of you, because you know you have to do this every 10 years, might have non-self-supporting adults living in your basement still, and they've already graduated college. So if you see an emancipated minor in that category, please write a case report. We need to hear about it. All right, so what do children do? They eat, poop, sleep, and cry, right? Eat, poop, sleep, and cry. That's what babies do. And so this first one, this first slide is about inconsolable crying. And that's different than just crying. Crying should be able to be, the child should be able to be soothed. The crying should stop. This is, in, this is like, bah! you know, like, oh my God, what happened to my child? And there's nothing you can do to console that child. Inconsolable. So the biggest category of that is intestinal colic, which is really crap because we really don't know that it's due to the intestine, right? It's colic because it comes and goes. The child will scream and it'll be like, terror child, and then they're all nice and normal and happy. And then terror child, and then nice and normal and happy. So the definition for intestinal colic is three things. Three hours a day, uh, three days a week for at least three weeks. That's a lot of crying, isn't it? You can see how it could drive parents and caregivers nuts. Now, it's more than 10% of children suffer from this. We had one out of our three, so we're contributing to the odds. And they had, they would just like scream and then be fine in between and then scream and be fine in between. Um, it's paroxysmal, like I said, it comes and goes. And the history, right, is fine. The physical is fine. Right? They, they put in this slide lab test. You don't necessarily need to do labs. This is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, but nothing else is showing up for this child to be crying. And so intestinal colic is a diagnosis of exclusion. It is, though, and if you notice, I put all my really important things in red, bold, underlined. That's how I got through med school. Red, bold, and underlined. Read the bold. Okay, so it's a risk factor for abuse. And who does the abusing? 
the mom's boyfriend, right? The odds are it's the mom's boyfriend. And so we need to be really supportive of these individuals to get them through this period. But you need to tell them that this too shall pass. Nobody has intestinal colic forever. And some of them grow up to be very beautiful, smart, bright 18-year-old daughters. <laughs> um, but it was long. And look at all the treatments. Look at all the treatments there are for intestinal colic. You know when you see lots and lots of treatment, what does that mean? Nothing works, right? Walk into any CVS drugstore or whatever drugstores you guys have down here, and there's the cough, cold, and flu aisle, and it's like, it's rows and rows and rows of stuff. It's because nothing really works. There is no cure for the common cold. There is no cure for intestinal colic, except for time. All right, so other things that can cause um, inconsolable crying, of course trauma can, right? And this can be soft tissue or it can be bony injury. It can cause inconsolable crying in the infant. Now, strangulation of a digit, so you've got to look at the fingers and toes. You've got to examine that child well and look for fingers and toes, looking for hair tourniquets. You know, mom's cuddling the child, the long hair, and it gets wrapped around the finger, and then they come in with this hair tourniquet. And the treatment for that is to cut down to the bone to get rid of that hair tourniquet. The exception to that, and this is two important things. First of all, if you have an inconsolable child, you need to take off the diaper. And if it's a male child, they may have a hair tourniquet around the penis. Please do not cut down to the bone. We have other treatments for um, getting rid of that hair tourniquet, such as some commercial products that dissolve the hair. Infections, of course, infections can cause inconsolable crying. If you have a child with meningitis, da, da, all these other things. But again, in bold, it says look under the diaper because they could have the worst. Haven't you seen a child? They look fine and you take off the diaper, you're like, oh my God, that is the worst case of diaper rash I have ever seen. I would be crying. I am crying looking at that. So take off the diaper. And then surgical conditions. And again, if you don't look under the diaper, you're not going to identify this uh, for the inconsolable child, looking for incarcerated hernias, testicular torsion, anal fissures. Parents love it when you take an interest in their children. Ask anybody at the break. Pick up somebody, your next door neighbor there, and just at the break, well, you have, so how are the kids? People love it when you take interest in your children, right? And so show an interest in the child, that means taking off the diaper. Oh, well, he came in for an earache, he's crying and stuff like that, I think we, but let's give him a good head-to-toe checkup while Johnny's here. Show that you care, and it really makes a difference. Parents absolutely love it. Um, there was one other thing in inconsolable crying. Oh, yeah, the old corneal abrasion. Has anybody tried to put fluorescein, if you have any, fluorescein into a two-month-old two that's screaming? First of all, I understand why there's a fluorescein shortage, because you're try you'll have fluorescein everywhere, except for the eye, right? And children at two months of age are really, really smart. You try to force that into their eye, do you think you're getting a look at their eye after you've got it into their eye? Uh, no. Okay, so corneal abrasion is another spot that you can look for inconsolable crying in children. So moving on from that to rapid breathing in the neonate. So neonates are defined as up to 28 days of life. Rapid breathing. You need to respect breathing in neonates and children in general. Because in this room, what are we most likely going to pass away from? Cardiac, right? But in children, they get into trouble because of respiratory distress. Respiratory is the big issue. And so I really s respect tachypnea. When you see a child breathing at 60 or 70, I'm like, oh, I'm worried. Their heart can go forever at 180, 200. Mine can't, but theirs can. It's young and healthy. So the breathing is where they get into trouble. So rapid breathing, and then, of course, it could be a respiratory infection, pneumonia, bronchiolitis, those types of things but other dysfunctions of organs. So it could be a sepsis from another source. A metabolic acidosis can cause them to rapidly breathe. Congenital diseases can cause them to rapidly breathe. Heart disease, and we're going to go through one, at least one specific one of the Tetralogy of Fallow, because they like putting that on exams, it seems. And then neuromuscular disease can cause rapid breathing as well. And so botulism is a top-down paralysis. All right, and a rapid really breathing child. And one of, this, this reminds me of one of the warnings, just like I mentioned earlier, about cough, cold, and flu preparations. The um, American Academy of Pediatrics and the FDA don't recommend cough syrups for children 
So a lot of people are turning to honey as a, quote, natural way to treat a cough, except for children under one. There's a warning that not to give botulism, not to give botulism, not to give honey. Please don't give botulism or Botox, but please, oh, that kid is so smooth. Um, That'll come up in my ENT lecture, actually. But um, if you're giving honey, right, botulism spores can live in honey, and under the age of one, it will stop coughing and everything else. All right, so vomiting in infants. Now, we, we need to be clear, when we're talking about vomiting in infants, we're not talking about the... I mean, kids spit, camels spit, right? Like little babies, they spit up, right? This is forceful vomiting. All right, now you can get this from increased intracranial pressure, and they used to call this shaken baby syndrome, right? They've changed the term. The AAP now calls it abusive head trauma, okay? So it's no longer shaken baby syndrome. It's abusive head trauma. Infections can cause vomiting. I mean, there are some kids, you look at them, and they vomit, right? They get their finger caught in the car door. They vomit. Anytime the child gets stressed out, they vomit. Right, so there's a long list of things, but there's some key points in there. If you have hepatobiliary disease, the child's going to be jaundice and vomiting. Inborn errors of metabolism, and I know what you're thinking, it's like, <gasps> I did my master's in fetal physiology and reproductive endocrinology, and inborn errors of metabolism is still like, <gasps> All you have to remember really is they usually have a low glucose in their metabolic acidosis, okay, for that general category. Um, malrotation of the gut. This is a serious one, and again, you're going to get yellow, green, bile stain vomiting, sometimes projectile vomiting, but that can be a tip off that you've got a blockage past the amper of Vader, not Vader, Vader, sorry. I'm too much of a Star Wars geek. But um, any of those kind of vomiting is a tip off where it's coming from and why it's happening. And then pyloric stenosis, and I think most of us know this. This is the child that's done well, and then sort of six to eight weeks in, they're falling off the growth curve, and they're getting skinny, and you feel right there, and there's a lump right there, and you're sending them for an ultrasound, right? And they've got all this vomiting. They're failing to thrive because of a pyloric stenosis. But that's putting the hand on the baby and going, hmm, the history fits. Yeah, that doesn't feel right. And this is a interlude. A lot of these slides are text heavy, and it's like, so I have this spaced interlude of just some pictures. Just take a moment. I can see why the gut might my, my mal rotated. Like, look at it, it's like a big slinky, and it can twist on itself. And this will get into some of the serious problems with regards to the gut. So diarrhea infections, back to the text heavy stuff, people. You've got to cram this in. Okay, so diarrhea. If it's in the winter, it's more likely to be a virus. And rotavirus is the number one, followed by adenovirus. But we're immunizing a lot of children against rotavirus. In the summer, it's bacteria. And you get salmonella, it's like, ooh, the chicken just didn't seem cooked, right? Or shigella, and this is a key. With shigella, it produces a toxin and that shigella can give you a really high fever, diarrhea, because we're talking about it, a really high fever, but they can seize, okay, a febrile seizure, but they'll get bloody diarrhea. So if you get an infant with a f high fever, seizing, and bloody diarrhea, you can think that this might be a bacteria called shigella. Overfeeding the child, fine. Anatomical abnormalities, immunodeficiencies, all of these things. Another one is, though, secondary lactate um, deficiency. And so if you have a child who's had gastroenteritis and they suffered from gastroenteritis, they can have trouble absorbing lactose or breaking down lactose. And so you get this fermentation in the gut and you get this osmotic diarrhea. So this is another common cause after a child's had gastroenteritis. How about blood in the infant's stool? I, I work in a community hospital, so I see children all the time, and I don't know what it is about parents, but they love keeping bloody poop, any kind of poop, really. And they come in, and it's in this beautiful wrapped diaper with Elmo on it and the little Velcro tabs, and they bring it out of this Lululemon bag, and then diaper bag, and then they, and then they want to open it and show it to you. And I look at them and I say, I've seen poop, and I've seen blood. It's okay. But they're, they, Johnny made boom boom, look, 
right? And, and it's all about the blood in the stool. And yes, it can help you. I mean, if it's on the outside and it's hard, okay, maybe it's an anal fissure or something like that. If it's all mixed in, if it's that red curry jelly stuff, okay, I get it. But it's like, really, do I have to look at their poopy diaper? I mean, I've already raised those three kids. I'm past that stage. All right, so when you're looking at it for blood in the uh, poop, it can be things like anal fissure, lactose deficiencies, uh, uh, intersusception, very serious one, salmonella or shigella, shigella is the one I was mentioning earlier. Um, there's some other theories, we're not going to go through those, but you can get a mulligan, you can get a miss. If the child looks well, you get one, right? Okay, the kid looks good, they had a little bit of blood in their poop, you know, you take them, you undress them, you do a good head-to-toe checkup, they look fine, you can send them home, right? But if it's an unwell-looking child, and it's multiple, then no. And here's one of those unwell children, and no, not sending them home. And this is a neonate, okay, up to the first 28 days of life, and this is necrotizing enteritis. And it usually occurs in the first week of life, and basically you've just got an ischemic gut, and you're sloughing off your intestines, okay? This is an emergency. And it's the most common GI emergency in neonates. Nobody really knows what it's uh, caused by, so it's called idiopathic. The idiots don't know the pathology. So it's idiopathic. We don't know what causes it. There's risk factors. There's, you know, things that put people at greater likelihood. Prematurity, though, is one of the biggest risks, 50 to 80 percent. So prematurity can lead to necrotizing, not lead, but be associated with necrotizing enteritis. Um, and the x-ray findings. The x-ray findings are what can really tip you off. The child will look unwell, but the x-rays can really help you. So I have an x-ray to show you. Now, this is a pretty easy case. You look at the child. The child's like 21 days old. They've got a fever. They look like crap. They've got bloody uh, diarrhea. They're really ill-looking. That's, oh, call your friendly neighborhood pediatric surgeon, right? That's a quick case. All right, broad-spectrum antibiotics. Here's the picture. Do not adjust your screen. It's not the screen. This looks fuzzy. The hostra lines look fuzzy. The wall of the bowel looks fuzzy because it's edematous, right? So it's not a focus problem. It's the actual problem showing up on plain film. Looking at that double density layer because it's so swollen. Bowel dilation, loss of the hostra lines. All right, moving on from that into neonatal jaundice. Now, if you want to play the odds, if you're seeing a child in the first 28 days of life, the most common readmission is neonatal jaundice, greater than 50%. Greater than 50% will be um, physiologic. So, okay, they just got a, too many red blood cells for the liver to handle. So you could just flip a coin and go, oh, well, it's probably that. Right? But you've got to look for serious stuff. Because if you've got a child, an infant, with jaundice, it could also be sepsis. So you've got to think of that. So if the child looks unwell, you've got to be thinking that. But you can also have breast milk jaundice. But that usually doesn't show up until the second or third week. So physiologic jaundice is like the newborn pictures. Johnny looks a little yellow in the pictures. Why don't we wait a week? Right? Whereas the... Um, Breast milk jaundice, that's when you're taking Johnny out for show and tell at two to three weeks, and they're starting to get more and more jaundice because of the breast milk, and because in the breast milk there's the glucuronal transferase inhibitors that are interfering with that, and so you get a jaundiced child. The treatment for that, for the breastfeeding one, is stop breastfeeding and go on to formula. And we like to promote breastfeeding, but it can be causing jaundice. The AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, recommends light treatment at various stages for one to two days old, two to three days old, or greater than three days old, and they've got various levels. I have not memorized that, and I probably never will memorize that. All right? But what I really want you to remember is, though, is if you have direct hyperbilirumia, I can't say anything this morning, I need another coffee. If you have it direct high billy, if you have a direct high billy, that means that it's gone through the liver. It's been processed, and it's not getting out. So you have a biliary obstruction, and this is a surgical emergency. So this is things to remember, right? I'm not remembering those numbers, but what I am remembering is if I've got a child with a high direct bili, I'm worried. I'm worried, and this child's getting worked up and admitted. 
Interception. This is the most common cause of bowel obstruction between three months and six years. But interestingly, it's the second most common cause of an acute abdomen in a child. We're always thinking, oh, it could be appendicitis, right? We're worried. It's the appendix, it's the appendix, it's the appendix. The second most common cause is intersusception. And it's usually on the right side. And so it's easily confused with appendicitis. Now, there's lots of things that can put you at risk for it, but it's idiopathic. And, uh, you know, the diagnostic method of choice for this is ultrasound. So the diagnostic method of choice for this condition is ultrasound. So I'll show you a picture of a CT scan, all right? But if you're thinking, okay, appendicitis, also think intersusception. And they'll get, it's, it's a different story than the appendix, right? The appendicitis is the grumbling along, getting sicker and sicker and sicker is the classic case. These children have colic. They get really intense pain as peristalsis and it's invaginating on itself. And then it's like, oh God, don't move. And then it gets really, really intense as it's invaginating on itself as peristalsis is happening. And then it's like, oh, don't move. Okay, so it's a different story than you see usually in appendicitis. But you get this sausage shape, usually on the right side, up into the epigastrium where the intersusception is taking place. So there's the CT scan. And if all my CT scans came with big arrows, I would be really good at CT scan reading. It would be really helpful if it also had a label of what it was, but in this case, it's intersusception. Okay, and so you can see circles there of bowel that don't look right. But take a look at this, think about it, and then go here. Got it? Here, here. And you can make that diagnosis at the bedside, right? With bedside ultrasound. Somebody said, oh, it looks like a cinnamon bun. Well, I wish it was that sweet and tasty. I always say it looks like a radar screen. And it's like, if I see that, if I've got a kid, right lower quadrant pain, and they're giving the story and stuff, and I'm getting out my ultrasound machine, I see that, my radar's going off. My radar's going off. This is intersusception. And you can see those concentric circles of the bowel as it invaginates on itself. All right, from that to bruise or bruise. Now, in 2006, the term was changed from apparent life-threatening event, an alti, to a brewie or a brew. And I think this was a great idea because, you know, how many times did I see a child with a parent, I said, well, it looks like they had an apparent life-threatening event. You're clear to go. And if it's dad coming, he's like, are you kidding? I can't tell my wife that. Oh yeah, the doctor said it was some life-threatening event because that's all they're going to hear. And they said it was fine to go home, right? So they rebranded it in a genius move to go, well, Johnny's had a brief and it's resolved, unexplained. We're not sure what it is, but throw out that life-threatening stuff and you've got people really, really scared. It's the same condition, okay? It's the same condition. They've just rebranded it. So it's a resolved event. It has to be in infants less than a year. Okay, so it has to be less than a year, has to less than one minute, and I know that's arbitrary. Nobody went, okay, go, Sally. Nope, she still looks cyanotic. 15 seconds. We're at 30. Still, in a, still a brew. You know, but they had to put something that it was like, you know, if you've ever seen a child have one of these events, a choking spell, a cyanotic spell, or even a febrile seizure, you know time and space become one. Right? It's like, oh my God, it lasted forever. Right? So they put it at one minute, basically to say this was something that was brief. All right? Brief. And there has to be no other explanation. So if they have a febrile, if they have a fever and it's a seizure, it's a febrile seizure. Right? It's not a brew. And they put these into high risk categories and low risk categories, and this dictates how you work them up. So high risk categories, if they're premature. So if you have a premature child or if they're less than 60 days. So the very young and the premature and they have more than one event. That's considered high risk. And then the opposite is true. So if they're older children, okay, they're older children, they weren't premature, duration less than a minute, no CPR by medical bystander because we've all seen people drop down and start doing compressions on someone who has a pulse, right? All right, so it's supposed to be by a medical professional, so first responders and stuff. 
And there's no concerning historical features, and that's in the bottom. So it has to be, the child looks well. There's nothing in the history suggests some badness is going on. And how do you work them up? Well, the high risk, they get the full meal deal. They get the full evaluation. If you have a child who has um, the high risk features, so they were premature, they were less than 60 days of age, you're doing that workup. Now, if they're low risk, you should educate the caregivers about what was going on, of course. SDM stands for shared decision making to guide the management, so you talk to the parents about what's going on in the caregivers and recommend CPR training. But you may do pertussis testing because there's pockets in the US that don't immunize their children for some reason. And also pertussis isn't 100% effective. It's not one of those really effective immunizations like hepatitis B and stuff. It's sitting around 80% instead of like 99%. Um, you can do an ECG if you want. You can do brief monitoring if you want, and you can do serial observations, and that's in the May category, and parents love that. Caregivers love that. I'm gonna take a look at Sally. She looks good. Okay, it looks like one of these brief resolved unexplained events. I'm gonna go see a couple more uh, patients, and then I'm gonna come back and do a second look just to make sure Sally's okay before you go home. Okay, so you can do serial observation. That's just fine. But you should not be doing CBC lights, BUN creatinine, glucose, you know, urine testing, blood cultures. This is not, the low risk patient doesn't get all of that invasive testing. And uh, you don't need to do viral testing. Um, urine analysis, oh, that opens up a whole nother kettle of fish, doesn't it? You know, if the child looks well and it was some brief, resolved, unexplained event, it's not a UTI. SIDS. SIDS, or Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, this is the most common cause of death from one month to one year, so outside the neonatal period, this is the most common cause of death, and it peaks between two to four months. We don't know why it happens, it's one of those idiopathic things, but there are risk factors, and risk factors are, it's inversely related to maternal age, so the younger the age, the higher the risk for SIDS. The more children that they have, and if a previous child has died of SIDS, that also puts the future children or the current children at greater risk under the age of one. And if there's drug abuse. So if you've got a teenage mom with three kids and one of them's died of SIDS and they're doing meth, oh, that child's at risk for SIDS, right? And so that's how I remember the risk factors for SIDS. Um, the, the key point for SIDS is sleeping position and they try to hammer home, have the child sleep on their back. That's the main message. Now, they have these like sla safe sleep things where you know, have the child on the back, don't have a lot of loose um, blankets, don't have stuffed animals, don't have some mobile floating around, don't let other children. I mean, we have three children. I don't know how we got out of the first year of life because we did everything wrong as parents. And we're, I think we're highly educated. But we had, oh, every little beanie baby you could put in there. We had mobiles of dolphins swirling above their head. We wanted to snuggle them. They, you know, our one daughter would always sleep on her front with her bum in the air. I mean, I'm surprised we didn't lose one, all right? We did everything wrong. But those are the risk factors. Have them sleep on their back. Pneumonia, I mentioned respiratory and respecting the respiratory system in children. Pneumonia is the most common site for infection in neonates, so up to 28 days, and it's group B strep. So the answer for neonates and pneumonia is group B strep. And that's why we screen pregnancy for group B. And that's why we treat pregnant women for group B if they have group B strep. Because children can pick this up in the neonatal period and they're young and they're vulnerable and this is a terrible devastating infection with a high mortality rate. Other causes can be strep pneumonia and H flu. Um, when you're looking at the child again, it's respecting that airway. You see the grunting and the nasal flares and the retractions. These are all serious signs. This is what children die from. Um, chlamydia, they don't tend to be febrile, so this is different. They have, so if you're seeing a description, a case description in your exam and stuff like that, you have a, a child that's afebrile, but to kipnik with a staccato cough, it's <coughs> and some conjunctivitis and hyperinflation, that's suggesting chlamydia pneumonia. And then, of course, there are all the viral causes like RSV and parainfluenza virus. And then just, a, just a, another brief comment about pertussis. Um, they get the, we have a whole section later in this lecture, but they get, they get this paroxysmal coughing and they can blow out their diaphragm from all the coughing and they can also blow out their rectum. And so you can get rectal prolapse because of pertussis. 
That's a bad case of pertussis, isn't it? It's like cough, 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 what? That doesn't look normal. Um, bronchiolitis. Um, Canadian, so we have two seasons, autumn and bronchiolitis. Um, we are bronchiolitis uh, centers of excellence. Uh, we see this all the time. And what's great about being an expert in bronchiolitis is because there's really not much you can do, right? Everybody's thrown the kitchen sink at these children and nothing really seems to work outside of supportive management and keeping them well hydrated. And I get it that we try, you know, bronchodilators and steroids because this could be a first presentation of asthma. You don't know that. And people give antibiotics because they're not sure if there's a, you know, a bacterial infectious component to it. So I understand that. But they get this mucus plugging, they get this wheezing, it sounds asthmatic, tachypnic, low-grade fevers. I love this thing about the SATs, between 90 and 93 for admission. You know how sneaky some researchers are? There was a group of researchers at uh, Toronto Sick Kids that you know what they did? They manipulated the O2 SAT monitor. Didn't tell the emergency physicians, and I think it was by 3%. And so randomly, the, you know, depending on which SAT monitor or how it worked, it would artificially elevate the SAT by 3%. And they watched what the judgment of the physicians for bronchiolitis was. And so guess what? If you had, you know, you had a kid that truly was at 92%, but the monitor read 95%, what'd you do? Send them home, right? Sneaky. And then they evaluated all these children and it didn't make a difference. There was no difference in outcome. And these children, and yet, yet we worship these SAT monitors. Certainly, if you've got a, a child with a low O2 SAT bronchiolitis, fine, the answer is admit, right? But they did that sneaky study where they manipulated the O2 SAT. The, the same researchers, I think it was the same researchers, did another study where they just sent the parents home with a SAT monitor, and it didn't show what the SATs were. It just recorded them. Sort of like going home with a halter for your kid with bronchiolitis. And guess what? a large portion, and like, like more than one or two percent, like double digit proportion of children had SATs in the 80s and even in the 70s for prolonged periods of time. It's amazing how well these children with bronchiolitis do. Anyways, keep them comfortable. Pertussis or whooping cough, um, this is, uh, goes through various phases where they have the acute phase with the cough, and then they have a two to four week paroxysmal phase and spasm with a whoop, but not everybody gets a whoop. Um, certainly the adults don't tend to get a whoop, and only about one-third of children get a whoop. And then it can, be, it can last up to 100 days. So in adults, it's called the 100-day cough. So the, the secret to this is immunize your children and immunize yourself. And now that we're giving out tetanus shots, we're including pertussis in those updates of those shots. Adults are the primary reservoir now, but transmitting it to the children or the unimmunized child or the child less than two months who hasn't had a chance to be immunized, that's where the danger lies for these. And again, these little children can blow through their hernia or blow out their rectum with this kind of coughing. Now, I love it. They, they say the treatment goal is decrease infectivity. I'd say the, the treatment goal should be to immunize everybody. But if you suspect it, you're supposed to give trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, or Bactrim, right? But we're supposed to be good stewards of antibiotics. So you get these kids come in. They've had a cough for three or four days, and that's why, you know, the caregivers waited two or three days, then came in. Should we be giving them all antibiotics, or is this a bunch of viruses? So I can understand why this might be a problem, and it'd be much easier if we just immunized everybody. All right, characteristics of febrile seizures. Febrile seizures are super, super scary for parents and caregivers. If you have your child and they've had a fever and you've been tending to them and you've got a cold compress on their brow and you've been giving them acetaminophen and you're giving ibuprofen and all of a sudden they go <laughs> and seize, oh, you can see why they'll freak out and come running in. But you need to reassure that a simple febrile seizure lasting less than five minutes associated with a fever, of course, because it's in the name, and it's in the right age group, and there's nothing else going on, you can be very reassuring to these uh, caregivers and parents that, you know what? Ask around the family. About a third of family members probably had this. Somebody in your family probably had this. This child might have another febrile seizure in this illness about one-third of the time. And about one-third of the time, the next time they have a febrile illness, they might have a seizure. 
One thing that's not on the slide is giving antipyretics do not prevent febrile seizures. So this obsessiveness that we have about the thermometer and keeping that child's temperature normal isn't necessary. And this whole thing about, oh, we've got to alternate and we've got to like synchronize and is there an app for that? All that kind of stuff. It's been shown that preventing the fever through regular regimens of antipyretics do not prevent febrile seizures. And of course, the AAP says a fever in and of itself in a healthy child is not dangerous, and we should be treating for comfort, not for temperature. So if the child's miserable, sure, give them an antipyretic. But if they're not miserable and they're happy and Johnny and Sally are fine, then you don't have to give it because that's their natural body's system fighting off the infection and trying to cook the bug. That's different than a complex febrile seizure. Longer than 15 minutes. Oh, now I'm concerned. I mean, if they're still seizing by the time they come in, that's not a simple febrile seizure. We're talking status epilepticus by that point, right? Right, so a simple febrile seizure is short in duration, right? But the complex seizure, febrile seizure, is lasting more than 15 minutes. I mean, that's concerning. Or if it's focal, or if it's outside the normal age range, so it's in the very young, the early months, and greater than five years of old age, now I'm thinking, this is a complex seizure. This needs to be taken way more seriously. Causes of seizure that are amenable to treatment, you'd be surprised how many children can have hypoglycemia and seize. I've seen this with gastroenteritis in children. They vomit and vomit and vomit, and they're not getting much fluid in, and they end up getting hypoglycemic and seize. And their sugar drops and they seize. And so the treatment, of course, is sugar water. Hyponatremia, I've never seen a child seize because of hyponatremia. Usually we have a lot of institutional wisdom and somebody's seen that in the audience. I've seen it in adults lots of times. You know, a sodium of 110, 112, and that person seizes. I usually don't have their sodium back when they, when they do seize, and then, ah, okay, yeah, their sodium was 111, I understand. Hypertonic saline. Hypocalcemia and hypomag giving those replacements, and then INH ingestion, and somebody's taking a lot of, uh, somebody's taking TB drugs, and the child gets into the TB drugs. Peroxidine is the um, solution for that. And if it's a hypertensive seizure, and I've never seen a hypertensive seizure in 23 years of emergency medicine in a pediatric case, hydralazine. Pediatric hydrocephalus. Um, this is increased CSF volume, so the volume goes up, and the pressure goes up. And the causes can be congenital or acquired. And you can break them down into non-communicating and communicating. And I always like this. I inherited this lecture from Rick Bucata. So he had that slide in there, and I had to go look up the movie. Anyone? Thank you. Yeah, no, I just had never seen the Cool Hand Luke, a failure to communicate. So uh, this was his si slide series, and I had to go back and Google it. All right. Um, they usually get a large head with a fontanelle, dilated scalp veins. You know, they've got these like gonzo heads, right? These big, huge, remember that cartoon with that Martian with the helmet on? That's what they sort of look like. It's just deforming the skull because of the pressure and the increased ventricle size. And you'll get all the things from increased pressure like headache, vomiting, lethargy, all those types of things. But the sixth nerve palsy is one of them. The sixth nerve palsy, and you know sixth nerve does lateral rectus, right, for your eye motions. So you get this strabismus due to the lateral rectus. And so it's in bold, it's in red, I think it's important. Um, increased lower uh, tone, so you get Babinski uh, signs, big toe going up, saying, hey, maybe this is hydrocephalus. Um, if you go like this, you can get a cracked pot sound because of the volume, all right? And on a CT scan, you'll see those increased ventricles. Now, the treatment is to put a shunt in there and drain that out of there. And again, there's institutional knowledge in here, and usually somebody here has been a real wow kind of person and gone in there. Somebody comes in with a block shunt, and they felt back there, and they've got a bulging uh, pump, uh, uh, bulge or whatever wherever it's called, that little thing that um, contains. They'll go in there and drain it. Has anybody done that? Usually one, co yeah, see, there's always some really good job. You know, and so they present with this increased pressure, and you stick the needle in there and just, <laughs> ah, goodness. All right, so that's an emergency tap, and you just tap the shunt. Now, if the shunt's been put in recently, and it looks like an infection, it looks like meningitis, picture when they're coming in, you know, they're febrile, they've got meningitis signs, then it's usually skin flora that's the cause. 
but if it's after six months, it, all bets are off that it's skin flora. Now this is thrown in there. This is not really pediatrics, but this is just following that natural progression from hydrocephalus. The idiopathic intracranial hypertension, also can all benign intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri. So this is in uh, young women, usually, usually a little overweight, and they get increased, um, increased pressure without increased size of the ventricles. And so they'll get the headaches, they get the vision changes, that's the tip off, they get the vision changes. So they're supposed to be followed serially for vision changes. And uh, weight loss is one of the treatment, but so is acetylcholamide uh, down there, uh, furosemide is down there, all these different things that can, um, are outside of my pay grade, like uh, nerve sheath fenestration, not doing that in the emergency department. Okay, but that was just put in there from completeness for the uh, continuation. An interlude, ah, papilledema, a picture. Don't you get tired of just seeing like words and words and words and somebody reading words to you? Ah, take a moment, take a breath. The center one is normal. So you see that nice crisp disc, right? It, and, you know, you get in there and you're like, you know, as soon as you do that, the pupil goes like this. But I love looking. I love looking at retinas. Now, it's sometimes really hard because they're older individuals with cataracts and stuff like that. But you get a young person and you're looking in there, pediatrics, and it's like, wow, that's a really nice picture. All the ones on the outside are showing a blurred disc margin. Ready to move on? All right. Meningitis in children. We divide that up into less than two months of age and over the two months of age because of infectious and treatment things. So under two months, we're looking at group B strep, again, delivery, and E. coli, again, the birth canal is near the other canal, okay? And so E. coli, group B strep, and listeria is the third one down there, and it's rare, but ampicillin needs to be used for listeria, so we threw that in there. Now, if it's greater than two years of age, you're looking at strep pneumonia and Neisseria. H flu is rare nowadays, and we're immunizing everybody for H flu, uh, the Hib. The highest mortality, though, is seen in strep pneumo for meningitis in children over the age of two. The treatment ceftriaxone, and we just put in a red flag there that um, you can't have a calcium-containing uh, fluid, IV fluid, because it can cause a precipitate, and that precipitate with ceftriaxone can cause badness. There's a Cochrane review in uh, 2013 looking at, hey, should I be giving steroids to children with meningitis? And I mean, I'm an EBM nerd, um, so Cochrane is a great resource, but they did a subgroup analysis based on level of income from the country. So in developed countries, so high income countries, they could find a signal if it, for mortality if the infection was due to uh, strep pneumo and decreased hearing loss if it was due to H flu. The you know, problem is when the child comes in and they look like meningitis, I don't know that for a few days and I'm not on call a few days later potentially and I'm making those treatment decisions now. So whether or not giving them steroids or not, the answer is giving them antibiotics plus or minus steroids with the advice of your uh, NICU team or PICU. Another picture, this is not your champagne tap. This is a Mm, cloudy tap. All right, tetralogy of fallow. This is the most common congenital uh, shunt. And this is one, my one chance to sound like a true Canadian. Ready? On the x-ray, you'll see a boot-shaped heart. I love saying that. It just comes out so naturally. Yeah, so you've got a boot-shaped heart on x-ray. And if you understand the physiology behind the tetralogy... If you understand the physiology, you understand why on the x-ray you get this boot-shaped heart, but you also get no markings in the periphery or very fine, very faint. You can't see the markings on x-ray, and it makes sense. So it looks different than congestive heart failure, right? Congestive heart failure, you get a big heart, but you get all this increased markings, right? In this case, you get decreased markings because the primary problem is a right-to-left shunt in the tetralogy. So we'll show it to you on a picture and it'll make sense. But you get this big right ventricle, big right ventricle, and then a VSD. So the blood wants to follow the path of least resistance. And if there's a big hole going from right to left, and you've got a pulmonary artery stenosis, this little cocktail straw as an outflow to the lung, everything's going to go deoxygenated 
over to the left side of the heart and out to the body. And that's why putting blow-by-blow -blow oxygen on this child is not going to work. There's no blood going out to the lungs to pick up the oxygen to bring it back to the heart to be pumped out to the body. So blow-by-blow -blow oxygen doesn't work. You need to keep the child calm because when they get one of these tet spells and go blue, keeping them calm is key because the more worked up they are, the worse it is. You want to increase resistance, vascular outflow resistance, so you make that right to left shunt less appealing than going the right way, which is through the pulmonary artery. So uh, the knees come up to increase that systemic vascular resistance. Some other treatments are to give some morphine just to calm the child down and the breathing. And they, they can get into some other stuff that, I mean, I'm not giving ketamine, and this is, this is something like I'd be calling my friendly neighborhood pediatric uh, specialist by this point. But there's the picture, and you can see it's got a big right ventricle. That hole going from right to left, not good. It's got a tight little pulmonary artery and the aortic septum over uh, arch is pushing against that as well. So you've got two things preventing it from going the way it wants to and a big wide open garage door saying, hey, go that way. And so you get deoxygenated blood. You don't get oxygenation of the blood. And there's what it looks like on x-ray. There's the boot. There's the boot. And very dark in the periphery. You don't see increased vascular markings. You see decreased vascular markings. Just one slide on HIV in uh, childhood. Um, in my hematology lecture, we'll be talking more about HIV. And this is just the fact that there's vertical transmission of HIV, which can be prevented. But then, um, so children can be born with HIV if not treated appropriately, and this can lead to growth retardation, lots of other problems. Of course, there's a strong association between STDs or STIs and HIV in adolescence. And with the febrile HIV positive child, the most common bacterial pathogen is pneumocystis carini, or pneumocystis, now it's called Jarevecki. Sometimes they go back and forth in the literature on this, so PCP or PJP, they keep changing their minds on what they want to call it. But it's the most common opportunistic infection in children with HIV. And the treatment is to give them Bactrim, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, and steroids. Um, it's characterized in these children with a disproportionate hypoxemia. In other words, the x-ray doesn't look that bad, but they're hypoxic. Like the hypoxia is out of proportion. Out of proportion to that, if you see a child and you go, okay, I think they've got pneumonia, the x-ray doesn't look that bad, and their SATs are really low, think HIV, think PJP or PCP. Kawasaki's disease. Now this is one they always like to like talk about for exam questions and stuff. It's also called mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome and it's a vasculitis. So it's a vasculitis and it's the small and medium blood vessels. The small and medium blood vessels are involved. Most of the cases are in children less than five years of age and they have to have a fever for five days plus four out of the five classic signs or symptoms. So a rash, and it looks like a measles rash. They get desquamation of their palms. They get all these mouth findings. They get conjunctivitis, and they get big glands. So if you see a child that's had a fever, and mom says, well, they've been, they've been sick since last Saturday, seven days. Okay, and you go, oh, geez, I can tell by the end of the bed they've got conjunctivitis. Let me look at those palms. Oh, and they've got a rash too? Hmm, feel for the glands in the neck. You're thinking Kawasaki's. Now, <clears throat> there's no definitive blood test, so you can't draw labs and say, aha, they've got Kawasaki's. This is a clinical diagnosis. Five days of fever, four to five of the classic symptoms. Now, you need to know, though, that these classic symptoms can come and go, right? They can come and go, and they don't all present at the same time necessarily or in a specific order. So you have to have a high index of suspicion. We have seen cases of this, but it's, it's not that common. It's really not that common but you need to catch them because they can get coronary artery aneurysms and you want to prevent that if possible. Coronary artery aneurysm is the big problem with Kawasaki's disease. Now the treatment is IVIG, so immunoglobulins, and then plus or minus ASA, and it'll depend on your institution. In 2009 there was a Cochrane review that says we don't have enough evidence to recommend it. 
the AHA, the American Heart Association, just updated in 2017 their thoughts on this, and they give it a level, uh, a grade C, a level two, but a grade C recommendation. And a grade C recommendation is like, meh, we don't have enough evidence to endorse it. Not saying it's wrong to give them ASA, but we don't have really any good evidence that it does anything. All right, a level D is don't do, and A is we should all be doing it. So it's a level C. So the answer is immunoglobulins plus or minus ASA. Cystic fibrosis is way more common, and we see this. I see this where I work. Cystic fibrosis is way more common than Kawasaki's disease or HIV in children. It'll depend on your practice population, but this is the most common lethal genetic disorder in Caucasians. It's autosomal recessive, it's about one in 2,000, and it's all the exocrine ductless glands. And so if you can think of what are all your glands that don't have ducts on them, that's what gets into trouble, and they get this thick mucus. And so they'll get it in their lungs. They'll get it in their sinuses. They'll get it in their gallbladder, their pancreas, their gut. They can get it in all these different glands. And one of the, one of the old-fashioned ways was the sweat test, right? Mom would come in and say she's hugging and kissing her newborn or her baby, and they taste salty, right? That's a, oh, okay, maybe this is cystic fibrosis. Usually by a year of age, the diagnosis has been made. They can get into small bowel obstructions. Um, they can get failure to thrive. They don't grow as well. Um, hypochloremic acidosis, diabetes from the pancreas, and rectal prolapse even. So this is just a nice picture to take a pause and go, yep, look at all the different things that this can affect. Anything from the sinuses, sweat glands, chest, gallbladder, pancreas, gut. So there's respiratory emergencies. They can get core pulmonal, right-sided heart failure. And if you think about it, if your lungs are filled with mucus and your right heart is just pumping and pumping and pumping, you can see how it would stretch out and fail. Hemoptysis, pneumothorax, and resp respiratory failure. Gastrointestinal emergencies, well again, if you get all this thick mucusy stuff, you can get into obstruction, intersusception, cystic fibrosis is a risk factor for it. Other emergencies, if it's uh, th throwing off your electrolytes and sweating chloride and stuff like that, dehydration and electrolyte abnormalities. All right, HSP, HSP. This is abdominal pain, GI bleeding, and hematuria. But it's a vasculitis. So when you see a purpura, you want to you break it into, is it a palpable purpura? Can I feel it? Or is it non-palpable? If it's palpable, that's a vasculitis. If it's non-palpable purpura, that's a problem with your platelets. Either you don't have enough, or they're not working right. So if you have a palpable purpura, vasculitis. If you have a non-palpable purpura, that means it's a platelet problem. And this one is a palpable purpura, so it's a vasculitis. You see it in preteens. Skin lesions are pathognomonic. This is the extensor tendon rash. The extensor, sorry, the extensor, not tendons, the extensor surface rash that you see with purpura, uh, buttocks and stuff like that. Renal involvement is key. Hematuria is key. But because it's not a platelet and a coagulopathy, when you work these people up and you see these children, you go, oh my God, look at all the purpura. This is bad. They have normal platelets, normal PT, which is INR, and normal PTT. Okay? So it's not a coagulation problem and it's not a platelet problem. It's a vasculitis. It's usually self-limiting, goes away within a month or so, gives steroids if symptomatic. Okay, so steroids, if symptomatic, it's self-limiting. And there's a picture of it. Extensor surfaces of the shins, right? Buttocks, the extensor surfaces, and they get these palpable purpura because it's a vasculitis. It's not a platelet problem. Okay, now we have hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS. This is acute renal failure. You're plugging up your kidneys with microangiopathic hemolytic Anemia, so it's a hemolytic anemia, so your hemoglobin's going to be down, but it also has a thrombocytopenia. Your platelets are down. You're plugging up your microvasculature. 
And it's, produ it's caused by the shiga toxin producing E. coli, 0157H7, so you'll see outbreaks. We had a huge outbreak in about 1990, late 90s, in the town next to mine, or very close to mine. And their water treatment plant was overcome by a huge rainfall, and the people that were responsible for maintaining the chlorination apparently were just checking the boxes, but actually not checking the chlorination for a long time. And then they had this huge rain, farmers, fields, a runoff, and then everybody in the town was exposed to this pathogen. Like thousands of people, thousands of people, because the whole water system was affected, huge. Acute bloody diarrhea, and they get into renal problems, and long term, you're looking at hypertension. They have normal INR, a normal PTT, and fibrinogen level, because this is not DIC, which is a consumptive coagulopathy. All right, uremia is almost universal, and it's similar to TTP, okay, it's similar, but it's the kidneys that really get involved in HUS. It's the kidneys that get involved, where it's the CNS system that gets involved in TTP. And we don't give antibiotics, because we don't want to tip the favor in favor of the bad bacteria, because you kill off some of the healthy bacteria, which is keeping the bad bacteria in check. That's what they learned. The town was called Walkerton. And that's what they learned. The people that got the antibiotics actually did worse. And you know that it can be, there, there are these outbreaks, and it's usually some hamburger joint, some, you know, sprouts from a grocery store, um, some salads recently I read in the news at, at some fast food had uh, outbreaks of E. coli. All right, so pediatric fluids. When it comes to pediatric fluids, it's sort of like, yeah, depends if you want to admit them or not. So it's an eyeball thing. Oh, yeah, I think they've got a severe deficit. It's, more, it's about 12%, right? That's telling the pediatric service they need to be admitted. If you don't want to admit them, oh, well, I think they're just mildly dehydrated, 3 to 4%. And those are the fluid requirements, 50, 100, and 150 um, mils per kilogram is what the deficit says. The key to this, though, is the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the World Health Organization says if you're going to rehydrate a child with mild to moderate, and remember, you're eyeballing them, mild to moderate dehydration, oral is the route to go, the route, the route to go. Okay, you're going through oral, not IV. And you don't need those fancy electrolyte solutions either. A study from a couple of years ago, I believe by Fleming, showed that half dilute apple juice and a fluid of choice was better than giving them some salty fluid that they didn't want to drink that cost a lot of money. In fact, it was, not, it was a non-inferiority study, but they actually showed superiority with that study. So um, you don't have to give them fancy oral electrolyte rehydration solutions you can just give them half-strength apple juice and or the fluid of their choice that they want to drink. Um, if they're severely dehydrated and you're running IVs, don't forget you've got to add sugar. Because if this is gastroenteritis and, and causing it, they can seize. And so give them some sugar water when you're giving them the IV. And then this was a change. I remember growing up and in early in my career, oh, you had to have this sort of brat diet. You had to reintroduce foods. The guidelines now say, you know what, if they've been, had gastroenteritis and stuff, reintroducing their normal diet at four to six hours post-treatment. That was a change. You can calculate fluid in pediatric dehydration, and so it's 100 mils for every kilogram for the first 10. So this is a formula you may have to calculate. 50 mils for the second 10 and 20 mils per kilogram for the remaining kilograms of weight. And I have to admit, I have an app for this. That's how I figure it out every single time I get out an app. And they talk about ongoing losses and maintenance therapy and stuff like that. You want to generally avoid sedating antiemetics, but I think everybody's now is using ondansetron. I mean, if you look at the use of ondansetron through the 2000s, then all of a sudden it just took this inflection point right, when it became available, and, and it just went like a vertical asymptote with regards to uh, being used for pediatrics and vomiting. A little bit about pediatric ACLS. I know you can take a whole weekend course on this. Basically, two joules per kilogram, all right, if you're defibrillating, half a joule if you're cardioverting. ET tubes, cuffed or uncuffed, it doesn't matter, but the uncuffed is more likely to leak. I have an app for calculating uh, tube size, but you can use this formula where it's 16 plus their age divided by four. You can look at their pinky and say, okay, is that the right tube size for the child? 
um, the surgical crike, um, various, various organizations have various numbers. They range from eight all the way up to 12, saying don't do a surgical crike. So I'm kind of not coming down hard on that because some say less than, uh, they have to be over 12, some say over 10, some say you can do it as low as eight, okay? So depending on the organization. Um, and fluid resuscitation, 20 mils per kilogram is the bolus of normal saline. More ACLS for peds. Uh, asystole is the most common arrest rhythm. Oh, I know that rhythm. Remember when you had to, had to remember all the different rhythms and it was shock, 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 everybody shock, little shock, big shock, mega shock. Do you guys remember that? I remember remembering that in the, uh, the mid-90s, sorry. So um, now pretty much everything is out and it's epinephrine for children. May not be so much for adults anymore after the paramedic 2 trial, but epinephrine is the drug of choice in asystole, and it's the ionotrope of choice. So it's epi. Wow, it's simple. Asystole and epi. I can remember those things. Bradycardia is the second most common arrhythmia. Um, always intubate. And so, um, you know, we've changed uh, to go CAB, right? CAB for adult ACLS. But for children, it's still remember your ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, look at the correctable causes, and V-fib and V-tac, these are rare. These are rare. They have sinus tac. They can tack along at 200 for a long time and be well, but V-fib and V-tac are rare. Um, you need to memorize this? Just kidding. Oh, you got to have some fun, right? Oh, my God, not that. Okay. All right. A lovely story. Virginia Apgard. Um, that was her name. I didn't know that until I put this lecture together about three years ago. That was her name. She came up with this, and it was her name. I thought it was like for appearance and pulse and grim whatever. You know, this was her name. She was a superhero of emergency medicine, and, uh, sorry, a superhero of medicine. So I just love that story. And it's a score of zero to 10. And you get one, uh, zero, one, or two points for each of the five things. Neonatal resuscitation priorities, um, you want to keep them dry. You don't want them wet. You don't want them cold. You want them dry, warmed, suctioned, and stimulated. Okay, and so that's why you see them, you know, you, 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 newborns, right? They come out, and what do they want to do? Rub them with a towel. They're under the lamps, and they're stimulating and suctioning their mouth and stuff like that. This is neonatal resuscitation 101. Keep them dry, warm, suction, tactile stimulation, oxygenation, bag, valve, mass, chest compressions, intubation, and epi's your drug. Now, there are three more slides, I believe three more slides, is it? No, four. 33 different things, and when I inherited this from Rick, he said, you know what you do with a list of 33 things? These are fun facts. These fun facts, you can read them on the airplane on the way home. Enjoy those fun facts on the way home. We're going to stop right there, and uh, we've got a break. And then after the break, Billy will be up, I think, with another uh, orthopedic lecture. Thank you.